This is the wild and wonderful Ferry Meadows and we are here today to show you how to catch bream in these conditions. Ferry Meadows, what is all the fuss about? Why is it one of the UK's leading bream meccas? Well, I think when you, when you turn up to Ferry Meadows and you see the size of it, the openness, the wild part of it, it kind of, like all bream waters, gives you that sense of, it's a bit mysterious. Am I gonna catch a few bream? Am I not gonna catch any? Am I gonna catch a load? Because it's a big water and bream typically shoal fish, and they'll be patrolling around in their favourite haunts. Has the wind been blowing this way? Has it been blowing that way? Is it warm? Is the water temperature right? Is the water clarity right? What time of season is it? So I think, as I just said, bream fishing is a little bit like that. And when you're either on them or you're not, and, but when you do catch them, there's something satisfying. And I think it's the fact you have to wait for the shoal to rock up. And then when you catch them, you know, you, you're reading line bites on your tip and round it goes. And sometimes there's quite a few little tricks and little bits of, you know, uh, angling art that you need to do to nick a few fish or whether it's the feeding to catch a lot of fish. And Ferry Meadows holds that. I mean, what a beautiful water. Controlled by Peterborough and District Angling Association. They've got fantastic waters and this... Uh, these flooded sort of lakes that they are are part of the Neen system. So the actual river runs in through and back out of these lakes which keep it fresh. It's always got food source and it's just a natural water. I believe that the fish migrate in and out of here as well. So, you know, let's get fishing. We're going to just, you know, fish here on the eye bank and see if we can catch you some of those mysterious bream. So bait, we bream fishing. And as we always say, it's simple. It starts with ground bait. And today I've got this heavy fish meal mix. This is a 50-50 green. And I've actually got it slightly dry at the moment, so I can still manipulate it if I want to. I'll dampen that off with the particles that I put in and the water that comes off them, which leads me on to them. Now, there's a lot of tubs here, but fundamentally, there's not a lot of baits here. I've got worms. I don't think you can ever go bream fishing without them. Natural waters, especially this time of year, we think the fish have been spawning and what happens after that is they're looking for food, they're looking for protein and worms provides that. But they don't always work, which is why at a venue like uh, Ferry Meadows, I always bring casters. Now, you'll have heard me say in the past that I don't actually use casters at some bream waters, but this is certainly one of them. Big shoals of bream, roam in the lake, and these are a fantastic holding bait. And what I mean by that is that when the fish actually arrive, you need to hold them, because there's not a lot of features here, and the fish are on the move. So you need a bait on the bottom that they can pick at. And once they get crunching on them, they'll absolutely love it. Another good holding bait is dead maggot. It's highly visible, also got lots of protein in it. So a little bit like casters, just a brilliant holding bait. But what that also does is makes a great hook bait. And so by introducing them into your uh, feed, that gets them tuned in to eating maggots and that can be a fantastic bait. So we've got worms, dead maggots, casters. Talking of hook baits, I think along with worms, any self-respecting bream angler would all, always try and get red worms. Red worms, don't ask me why, I don't know if it's the fact that they wriggle, I don't know if it's the fact that they're dark and they taste strong because of the, what they're growing. These are fresh from a, a local horse manure pile. They look fantastic, they wriggle and certainly can be a brilliant target bait when you're looking for an odd big bream. And then I always have a bit of corn, really important. It's a big bait, it's a sight bait and sometimes when it's a bit tough, you can put a piece on the hair rig and you'll get bites off that. So. Fundamentally, that's the bait. Let's go and put it into action. So I ran through the bait I'm gonna to use today, but here's how I'm actually gonna apply it. Now, as I've probably touched on, there are big roaming shoals of bream here. So what you've got to try and do, if, you, if you're lucky, they'll be there when you, when you start, but they're not always in front of you. And as they're coming along and they're finding your swim that you're creating, you need to hold them. So for me, and it's, you know, uh, some people think that you've got to feel your way into a match, 
Personally, I'm looking to catch lots of big fish, therefore I need to hold them on a big patch. So I'm not going to be shy about bait. So what I tend to do is measure out an amount of bait at the start. So I've took around a third of a pint of those dead maggots. I'll get a good helping of corn because I want some big uh, heavy bait that small fish can't sort of just pick up and that'll just sit on the bottom over the top of uh, everything that I'm feeding. Then I'll take a similar measure that'll be probably half a pint of casters and introduce them at the start. So I've got dead maggots, I've got corn and I've got casters and what I'll actually do is use that as neat particles and scrub that with my feeding feeder and nip it off with the ground bait that I've mixed so that I know that I've got in, in total there is nearly sort of a pint and a quarter of bait and I'll put that in at the start because I want to make sure that when they rock up I'm going to hold them in the swim I can then feed on top of that I've not put tons of worms in I've mentioned worms earlier because I like to use that as a kind of ignition trigger bait so when the fish are there you can actually inject worms in sort of neat more uh, potent quantities and I think that becomes more effective as a bait the rest of it is just creating a bed and that is what we're going to introduce at the start so obviously feeding a bed of bait, an amount of bait, takes a certain kind of kit and really windy day today, I'm only fishing at 40 metres but I've still gunned up. This is a 12 and a half foot feeding feeder rod, I've got a nice big carp reel onto here which obviously helps with line release, that's coupled with heavy braid, I've actually even got a shock leader onto that and dangling off the bottom of that is a 50 gram bait up feeder, that may seem excessive but to bait up accurately and create the swim that you're looking for, you need to make sure you get it there and you get it accurate. So that's the sort of kit you're going to need now. Let's get some baiting and get fishing. So that amount of bait that we've just put into the swim actually amounted to 10 big feederfuls. So just to give you some idea, uh, if you're not going to measure it out, that's like sort of raw, what I call meat, the particles, the maggots, the casters, the corn. That's right into the swim now, so I know that I can fish with a smaller feeder, I can be more accurate, a little bit quieter when I'm fishing, and I've got a bed of bait. So I can adjust then with my fishing feeder what I want to offer the fish. So tackle wise, um, obviously we need, we've got wind, you saw us when we were baiting up, so you can't be sort of faint hearted about it. We're only fishing 40 metres today, but because of the conditions, we're going to use kit that we'd probably use at 50 and 60 metres, and we've pulled it back a little bit. The most important thing is that you can reach the area that you're trying to fish. There's no point in oversetting yourself. If you prefer to use sort of lighter kit or smaller kit or less aggressive kit, then choose your sort of target accordingly and fish to your strength. So if you want to use a shorter rod because that's your style, then sort of pitch your swim a bit, a bit shorter. But for us, I think we always try and fish as far out as we can at Ferry Meadows because the bream is quite clear, they're a little bit shy. As I said, they roam around and you want to be able to sort of make them comfortable. So we've created that swim out there at 40 metres. And for that, I've got a 12 foot six rod here. This is a 50 gram rated rod which will easily cast 30, 40 and 50 gram feeders into an headwind like this. Now, I've actually coupled that up with um, a bit of a combination set there, which is, this is 018 detection line, and I've got tied to that uh, an 026, which is eight pound shock leader. Now, you can use stronger shock leaders if you wish, but because of the way that I terminate my rig, which is, I've just tied it off to a stock, I'll show you that in a little bit, dead simple, sort of sliding pattern Oster rig, that means I can use the same diameter shot leader for my drop, which is stiff enough to kick it out, but not too stiff that it's going to tangle when I'm casting and flap about in the wind. 
So that's a simple rig. I shall start off here with a 40 gram zippler and tied to that, I'll probably kick it off with, I'll probably only use two hooks here today. It'll be a series 18 in size 12. I've got that tied to 016. I do have some tied to stronger line and the reason for that being that sometimes it gets quite weedy here but that's not yet because it's too early in the season and the fish can pull you through sort of weed and you get cut off. So an 016 size 12 is great and then my other hook that I'll use is a B983 in a size 12 and that's tied to actually stronger line, that's 018 because I think when you're air rigging you can get away with being a little bit more aggressive. So that's one rod, I've actually got other rods set up, one is a uh, six pound detection straight through to the same rod and that'll be for throwing a method feeder and because it's straight through I'm quite comfortable with that and I've not got a feeder running on the line so the use of a shock leader I don't feel isn't it's necessary at this distance and then the last rod is same again but this is um, the same again it's got a four pound 018 detection on to an eight pound shocker and this one's set up in a helicopter rig style and the reason for that is that if the wind is smacking his faces we might struggle to keep his rig fishing you know when you cast into a wind you can sometimes get taffles and the helicopter rig is a fantastic uh, method for fishing in the wind it's sort of bomb proof it's not how I prefer to fish because I don't particularly like the way that the fish pick it up and sometimes the bite indication especially on smaller fish, but you can get away with it on the big bream that you're expecting to see here, and it is windproof. So that's dead simple. So we're gonna get fish in and uh, see if them bream have rocked up onto that bait we've put in. So that initial feed has actually been in for about an hour now. Now, the idea of that today is just to let the fish settle. But if this was a match, and this is quite a heavily matched fish venue, it can take, and ordinarily does take, a while up to an hour sometimes longer for the fish to find your bait but on occasions you can catch them quicker than that but I reckon that we should have a few fish sitting right over the top of that bait let's just chuck in and see that's just it bottom there look and just try and keep a check when you're chucking in like that just to check on your on your line keep your rod low in these conditions because when you're casting out you get a big ball <clears throat> and the beauty about low stretch reel lines is the fact that you can keep your line tight and keep a nice contact with your bait always try and put your rod in my opinion into the wind and that allows any kind of ball just to keep your tip in the right way and you can see indications a lot easier than you can if you were fishing the other way where you get a ball going that way and now, so it's most people prefer to fish away from the wind, but me personally, I like to face into the wind for that very reason. Now, sometimes you'll get a bite as the feeder hits the bottom with these kind of fish. The water is very clear and the fish can feed on sight basically. Um, and I think they follow the bait down, they can they see the feeder, whether it's the noise or whether they're already in your swim. And the bait falling through the water, they'll sometimes, I've had them actually take the rod out of my hand while the feeder's just at the bottom. On other occasions, you have to wait, and that's when they've been a little bit more cautious, because sometimes they back away from the feeder landing, and then you've got to wait for them to come back over the swim and find your hook bait. To help you do that, and get a pattern. Sometimes a stopwatch is a great addition to anybody's fishing. And when you've cast in, set your stopwatch and you can keep an eye on it. And if you get your first bite at three minutes and then your third bite, let's some fourth bite, fifth bite, they're all under five minutes, you know that you don't have to leave it in and they're responding to casting. If it takes eight, ten minutes to cast, there's no point in keep going in all the time because it might be that the fish are backing off from what you're doing. So just a little tip that, just to probably maximise uh, on your fish catching potential because you're reading what's happening in the swim. It might change up and down in the daytime as the fish change their habits, as they become more confident, but it will help you build a pattern through your day so you get to know how long you need to be fishing for.
and that looks I was expecting that to tow right round and it didn't and I think that's because it's not particularly a big fish but it's a great start I just started on double maggot which is for some reason always a start bait for me I think historically I always felt that it gave me the chance to catch anything in the swim not just a target bream and that will read read the peg somewhat so that for instance if I caught a roach I'd know that all my particles were probably getting eaten by small fish and it, you know if you had a big bait on would you know that the smaller fish were in your peg but then once you know what's arrived in your swim you can then change accordingly and try and pinpoint bigger fish or the bait that they want whether that be worms or bunches of maggots bunch of casters red worms and that is a very welcome start and that's quite a young fish Ferry Meadows is famous for big black bream now I ain't got small hands by any stretch of the imagination and that's still despite it being one of the smaller specimens still a good fish that's probably closer to three pound than it is to two and a half beautiful fish and we'll just see if we can catch another one That wind certainly hasn't dropped and that's a 40 gram medium zipper cage which is cutting through that wind perfectly. Just give me enough weight so I can control where I'm casting it. And obviously adjusting for the wind because the wind's kind of crossing in a little bit so if you just try and um, gauge that you need a little bit of a swing around once you've hit your clip and drop your rod and allow your feeder just to land in the same spot and you can adjust it slightly on the wind and that's something that you'll get with time and practice so I'll just set my stopwatch again because that was I had a little look down while I was playing that fish and that had only been in two and a half minutes so that was fairly quick bite And we'll just keep an eye on that and see if that becomes a pattern. And that's definitely on. And that's the sort of bite we're talking about where it rocks because the fish has got the bait in its mouth and it's trying to shake it off. And that's decided all of a sudden to start pulling back. That's kiting off upstream. Feels like a similar sort of fish. Lovely textbook bite, and that's actually been in six minutes. So that just goes to show you the contrast between. I've got a funny feeling this is not a bream. This could be a tench because it was an odd bite and when I said to you it's pulling back a bit so I've just stood up because if it is I definitely don't want to lose it
it's certainly got a bit of uh, zest about it. I know there's some really beautiful tension here because on a we came for a practice um, a couple of years back, myself and Lee Kerry, and uh, I had my personal best tench from um, Overton Lake, the next lake along, estimated at nearly nine pound. And that were a, f a fish I'll never forget, beautiful fish it was. And this one's certainly giving up a bit of a fight. So I'll just take my time because it could be a, a definite fish worth catching. He's probably more shocked than I am. And I have just seen that because this water is a lot clearer than you think because it's windy, you can't actually see the clarity, but I actually saw that fish then. And I definitely don't want to lose him, so. Here he is. A feisty character and he's not quite ready I can assure you look at that well if we don't catch anything else today I won't mind because that is a beautiful wild ferry meadows tench and I'll tell you what that is that's the second biggest tench I've ever caught I can assure you let me just show you that tench love maggots casters and worms and that one certainly wanted it look at that what a fantastic fish what a beauty so I'm just popping another up length on because that tench pulled a bit and I'll tell you what when it went down this edge I felt it go through a, through a few rushes and if there's another tench lurking in there, I don't want to go back out with the same up length. So I've actually just changed that up length for a fresh one. Same again, that's series 18, size 12, to 16. And it's fish like that tench that sort of make it worthwhile, just making sure you're gunned up properly, you've got the right strength hook on, the right size up length, you know, diameter and strength. Because why would you want to lose one of them? absolutely fantastic creature and I thought it was a strange bite it was more of a, a rocking motion as I said to you sometimes get a brain that trying to shake the hook out of its mouth but that were clearly the tench trying to do the same thing let's see if there's another one there So we quickly realised that obviously that initial feed has attracted those fish, casters, maggots, a few worms, a bit of corn. And I set off fishing, um, as I said, I started off with uh, size 12, series 18 to 016, and I just kicked off with, that's the small zipper, 40 grammer, because of course I'd already got that bait and I didn't want to overdo it because it might be a day when there's not tons of fish feeding, but I'm now starting to think, 
if I'm not careful here, they're going to mop up all that bait. These fish are hungry. I think they've been spawning and they're ready to feed again. So I'm going to go skip that and go straight to a large. Um, and, and basically when I sort of go out into the water and take a few feeders with me, I take a variety of sizes. And the reason for that being that, for instance, if it was an hard day and I'm sort of just looking for one or two fish, I carry small feeders where I can nip a bit of ground bait in, nice and tight with very few particles in it, so I'm not overfeeding the swim, and pick off the fish and make them hunt around, hopefully clear up the bait that's you know in the peg, and, and maximise on the fact they're going to focus on my hook bait rather than too many particles that I'm feeding. But I started off on that small, there's a median, I'm now going to go straight up to a large, I've had that tench, I've had five bream, they're hungry fish. I'm going to keep adding and I'm going to put more casters in because I think they're a fantastic bait as I said earlier. I'm putting a few worms in and I probably think that although I've caught all my fish on double maggot because that's what I started off, that's what I started off on as I said to you that I like to just feel what's in my swim and maggot catches everything. Um, I'll probably finish up trying to worm in a, in a short while but why would you change what you're catching on? Just keep doing that and build that swim. The fish have certainly got slightly bigger, the first one with the smallest one we've had and um, the big bream are here, so let's keep going through the paces and up, up our game and see if that makes any changes. Does it catch them quicker? Does it catch them better? Or does it put them off? Because it could do. Let's see. When you sit here at Freddie Meadows and you just, it feels, you're at one with nature, it's a big venue, you're not kind of hemmed in. Unless anglers go out in the water, you probably won't even see anybody. But when you look across it, the sort of, for me, it's like a, the enigma of, is there gonna be some fish here? And over the years, I've had some great days here. And um, the first time I ever came here, we, it would have, I think an old Dren Super League. And it really sticks in my mind because we didn't really fish, we didn't have the kit that we have today. We didn't have sort of the rods and we didn't fish the distances. We didn't have the feeders. And we didn't have the knowledge really. And I think it were over on the monument. Um, I'll never forget it because it, it were a bit of a sit and wait job as Ferry can be. And um, Lee Klimchuk, who were fishing I think for Essex at the time, he was catching on a pole and I thought, oh, I made a mistake here. I was sat long for a bream or, when I say long, probably 50 or 60 metres at the time because that was probably as far as we could cast with what we'd got. And eventually they rocked up and for the last hour and a half I had one a chuck and that kind of was my first and sort of lasting impression of Ferry Med is that there's these big shoals of bream that swim round and once they rock up, it's um, it's fantastic fishing. You can really rack a weight up in a match. And um, before I came today, actually, the last time I fished, because uh, Ferry Meadows has been good to me, the last time I fished were a Feeder Masters qualifier, and I drew the MPEG on Overton, which always has a chance, uh, down by the river mouth. And uh, that was a tough old day, but typically, and I suppose there's a pattern forming with, with this, that. Um, I think I had 60 pound, but I had four in the last 12 minutes that would all be five pound a piece. So, you know, I sort of added 30% of my weight in the last uh, knockings of the match. And that is what I think is the, the attraction and the draw. With an hour to go, you can still win a match here. Um, I mean, big weights uh, are quite common here. I've seen 180 pounds, I think there's been 190 last year, and I know there's been a 200. My biggest uh, weight is on the famous fence end, which I, th I can't remember the number, I think it's somewhere in the 80s, uh, and it's pr pretty much directly opposite 
where we are today and um, lovely warm day like it is today, windy and I gathered the bream shoulder and I think I had 21 fish for 109 pound so you know anything can happen here at Ferry um, I've qualified for Feeder Master a couple of times once we only 36 pound and they were big fish that day and it's just a place that you can't help but be drawn to um, because you never know if you're going to catch them or not you can sit there three or four hours with nothing up they come your rod gets dragged in I mean what's not to love about that kind of fishing and if you do catch an odd tench like we've done today it um, leaves a little well you can see I've got a big sparkle in my, uh, my eye it's just brilliant it's a great fishery quite challenging but I think that adds to the spice of it so if you get a chance to get yourself down here on one of Peterborough's waters especially this one which is their real jewel in the crown then uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy great sport and hopefully we'll put you right on a few things today that'll help you to catch some fish so I've just changed to a slightly bigger feeder because I was thinking there's a lot of fish in swim and they're going to need some more bait and strangely enough I've actually not caught one since I've put it on and from being consistently good and that's just got me to thinking something I just want to share with you that all feeders might seem equal and, and they're not and I've actually put a large on this is a small one that we're fishing with and I've skipped the medium and I've gone to a large which is sitting out there in my swim at the moment and I was just thinking to myself that I'm delivering bait but although you know we're, we're catching well it's not sort of frantic it's not going in and going straight round and I was wondering if that change has actually affected me um, catching fish because yes delivering bait is very important because we need to keep them feeding but actually the release of the bait out of your feeder can be massive and I learned this some years ago that not all feeders squeeze the same so you know they look similar but because of the diameter of a feeder and the way you squeeze it and the way you load it that can be massive and often and that's why I carry, you know, all sorts of different sizes right down to a, a, a mini there because you can nip in your ground bait and it'll just stay in your feeder a bit longer and make the fish work for your hook bait. So I'm going to have two or three more chucks with this big feeder but I'm very mindful that I'm going to drop straight back to where I was because it might not be the amount of feed, it might be the time it takes to release it. So I might have to learn how to load this bigger feeder but that, saying all that, Breen probably make a fall out of it because it looks like I've got an indication and that looks like another bite that one's took quite a while that's two chucks and that's been in seven minutes so we'll keep an eye on that but it's just something to bear in mind there's lots of different feeders on the market these days and in the bag behind me you know I've got all types of feeders I've got rockets and I've got wire ones and plastic ones and also window feeders because you have to think about, if you were fishing a pole and you were loose feeding, sometimes you'd throw three or four in, sometimes you'd throw a handful in, sometimes you'd throw them in before you laid your rig in, sometimes you'd, you'd want to put a big pot full in and the fish over the top of it with single bait, but just because it's a feeder, don't think it's that simple. Vary it up and think about the results you get from the changes that you make while you're fishing. And that'll help you to build a picture up of the tools that you have which are your feeders that allow you to catch more fish and we'll just net this one and enjoy what's turning out to be a great day's sport lovely fish And that is a cracking ferry meadows bream. That one's a real thick set fish. And maybe that bigger feeder has brought a few more in. Maybe they just backed off a little bit, who knows? But that's the thing, you must keep experimenting and trying different things and analysing it. So you can build a picture and understand what's happening in your swim because Catching fish is the name of the game and they don't give the souls up easy, do they?
Look at him. So we're well into the session and I've been introducing worms. So I thought I'll just pop a worm on the hook. And actually I had, I had a fish. So I've just stuck on an air rig and I spoke about that when I talked about the kit that I'd be using. And they're so effective and really worth carrying in your armory because I'm convinced that when the fish are feeding a certain way, there's nothing to beat it because you just get more conversions. I think the way that the fish pick it up, they just find it harder to eject and you can fish a nice big worm knowing that you're not going to get it doubled over your hook as the fish is kind of chewing it round in its throat. And, and I've, in the past I've seen it where it just turns little indications into fish, which probably means that you're getting picked up um, when you're fishing bait direct on hook conventionally but they just can't get rid of the hook when you've got an air rig on sometimes. So I've just tried that and got one straight away and I've put on quite a big dendrobina. And I'll show you what we do and how we, how we up one of those. And I think it's a fantastic method that you've got to consider when you're fishing like this. So you can see that is perfectly presented. The air rig with the quick stop has gone straight through its head and that allows a full worm, but I have just nipped the tail off and for me that prevents the, the worm from killing up and doubling back over onto the top of the hook because sometimes they try and wind themselves around the hook and by just nipping the tail off, that for me just keeps it perfect. It's still moving, still active, but it's a nice big target bait and that can be deadly for catching fish. You can also do smaller pieces of worm and sometimes two pieces of worm that size can also be a brilliant method. So just experiment with that. I've even caught air rigging red worms, two or three through an air rig can be a deadly, deadly bait. So ring the changes because some days you just don't know what them fish want. And by trying these little different up baits and making sure that you can go through the varieties, you will find exactly the right uh, bait for that day in question. So Ferry Meadows is sort of the gift that keeps on giving. Um, it's not let us down today, it's just proved that on the right day, bream fishing can be, what I'm gonna say, relatively easy, because it's been textbook bream fishing today. Obviously, we fed it at the start with those particles, and sure enough, just like predicted, we waited a little while, and the bream rocked up, and it's basically been, apart from the interruption of a beautiful tench, it's just been one bream after another. And, you know, we've obviously gone up a little bit, introduced more feed, pulled it back a little bit, worms on the hook, we've put the air rig on. I'm not going to say that you can catch on anything today because that would be kind of foolhardy, but um, everything seems to have worked. I think the conditions, time of year, nice breeze, uh, it's, been, it's been incredible and really enjoyed this day. And hopefully if you just sort of follow those simple uh, tactics that you need, and there you go, that looks like another one. By just, that one's pulling back. If you just think about, you know, getting some bait in, think about the size of the shoal that you're trying to catch. Make sure you keep accurate once or twice. I'm not sure if Joe's caught it on camera because he's obviously trying to make me look good but you know I've had an odd mis miscast and as I said let it go to the bottom empty it out on the bottom don't empty it out as it's the water because you'll spread your fish and make sure that you're fishing on the spot because a that will not only build your swim but it will increase your chance of catching fish and be patient wait for the fish we've had some bites have been under a minute some bites have been seven minutes but by introducing worms, dead maggots, casters, I mean these fish are on worms now, I've, I've got this air rig worm on and it's working really well. You can enjoy a great day sport at what can only be described as a beautiful fishery. We've seen kites, there's swans, there's wildlife, there's tons of fish clearly. It's well looked after by Peterborough and District. The fish are all in great condition. I mean, this one's pulling back. So get yourself down to Ferry Meadows. 
you catch yourself some cracking bream and a tench if you're lucky, you won't be disappointed. And look at that absolute Ferry Meadows beauty. So if you want to come down here to Ferry Meadows, check out the website which is fishinginpeterborough.co.uk and you can enjoy some cracking sport. And it's not just this fishery that they have, they have tons and tons of waters. And I'm sure they're all equally as good as this place. I mean, look at that. What's not to love?